very warm welcome on behalf of uh, Team Nia CSP. I thank uh, Ashwini ma'am to accept our invitation. So thank you so much ma'am. I'll now request Meera Kumar Menon, a doctoral scholar with uh, Team CSP to please introduce uh, Ashwini ma'am and also the topic of today. Over to you Meera. Thank you, thank you Niharika and uh, a very warm welcome to you Ashwini ma'am. It is indeed a pleasure to have you here with us today. So a few words. Um, Ashni Anvi is the founder director of Mukta Foundation, which is an organization committed to, to prevent interpersonal abuse and promote mental health. She was earlier a faculty member in postgraduate department of psychological counseling at Montfort College, Jain University, Bangalore. She is a counseling psychologist with practice and research interest in the area of prevention and prevention of interpersonal violence, such as intimate partner violence, child abuse, bullying, etc. She was recognized as one of the 100 leaders under 30 from across the globe for her idea titled Focus, Formula to Foster Mental Health in Low and Middle Income Countries at St. Gallen Symposium, Switzerland in May 2015. Mukta Foundation was appreciated by Kailash Satyarthi, Nobel Peace Prize winner for its collaboration with Young Indians of Confederation of Indian Industries for the project, <laughs> a nationwide initiative to prevent child sexual abuse in September 2016. She is the recipient of Rotary Bangalore's Vocational Service Award 2018-19 for her work uh, in the area of training and promotion of mental health. In the year 2019, she directed a campaign titled Child Safety National Priority, where she traveled nonstop 90 days for January, from January 1st to April 1st, 2019, to all the 29 states and three union territories to conduct over 150 plus training sessions on prevention of child sexual abuse thereby becoming the first person to have done this consecutively in the country. So, so much about uh, Ashwini ma'am, and now we know why it is uh, such an honor to have somebody so spectacular with us today. And she will be talking about uh, a very, very sensitive as well as very important topic, uh, which is on child sexual abuse and interpersonal relationship abuse and so forth. So uh, we are very uh, glad and looking forward to hear you from, hear from you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Meera, for such a warm welcome. And uh, let me also thank Niharika for connecting with me and in turn connecting me with, uh, you know, all the participants in the event that's organized by Nia CSP. You know, very happy uh, to be uh, with all of you. And as I've been told uh, to all the participants, we'll keep the first uh, 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, I'm going to introduce the topic and share a few of uh, my perspectives on it. Meanwhile, if there is any question, uh, any comment, uh, anything that you've observed that you wish to share, feel free to, even during, uh, you know, the first segment of uh, today's program. But at the end of the program, uh, about 15 to 20 minutes, let's keep it exclusively for interaction. Yeah, so you can either uh, unmute and speak or uh, if you're comfortable leaving uh, a comment or a question on uh, the chat box, I'd be happy to also uh, look at your comments there. So let me uh, begin uh, this, you know, the session. I'll share the screen and you confirm whether you're able to see it. Yes, ma'am. Are you all able to see this? Okay, yes, great. Yes. Okay. Um, so my organization, Mukta Foundation, we have two objectives. One is prevention of interpersonal violence. And then we also uh, aim at promoting mental health. The reason why we've brought these two objectives together is because we believe that they are related. And how are they related? In a uh, inversely correlated manner. So what does that mean? All our efforts to prevent interpersonal abuse would contribute, you know, indirectly to the promotion of mental health. And all our efforts to also promote mental health would, uh, you know, uh, contribute to prevention of various forms of, uh, you know, uh, interpersonal violence. Now, I'll first talk to you all about how violence in itself can be categorized. Yeah, look at the first picture here. Violence are of many forms, you know, let's say physical violence, emotional violence, uh, verbal violence, uh, financial violence, technological violence, sexual violence. These are the various forms of emotional violence. But broadly, 
uh, we can categorize violence as being self-directed abuse, interpersonal abuse, and collective abuse. Now, what do I mean by uh, self-directed abuse? Uh, look at the word self-directed abuse. What does that mean? These uh, abuse, uh, the examples of which could be uh, self-harm, right? Self-harm is an example of self-directed abuse or even suicidal uh, you know, behavior is an example of self-directed abuse wherein you're harming you know, oneself. On the other hand, interpersonal abuse, what does it mean? It means any violation of rights or boundaries, and it can also escalate to the level of intense violence, like that of murder, you know, rape, the entire range, beginning with you know, subtle violations to intense violence, in any interpersonal relationships, we are using the term interpersonal abuse to describe that phenomenon. Hmm? And then what does collective abuse mean? Collective abuse, uh, violence, we might have seen riots, you know, in the name of religion between two uh, groups of people. When collectively there is violence from one uh, group uh, towards the other, we call it collective abuse. But today what we are going to uh, focus on is what I've highlighted as interpersonal abuse. Interpersonal abuse can occur between uh, people that we know as well as people who are strangers. Public space, private space. Bay child sexual abuse is an example of interpersonal abuse. Intimate partner violence is an example. Bullying, be it cyber bullying or bullying that happens on uh, the field. Uh, elderly violence, all of this, uh, you know, we are using the collective term of interpersonal abuse. But today, while I'm going to focus on interpersonal abuse, especially intimate partner violence and child sexual abuse, I want to also focus on the mental health component, you know, uh, related to interpersonal abuse from three perspectives. Now, what are these three perspectives? I wish to talk about interpersonal abuse and mental health from the perspective of the survivor. I'm just going to introduce few studies. You know, this is almost like the, the tip of the iceberg. No, I just want to introduce an idea so that uh, maybe you would, uh, if you're interested, you can either continue uh, working in it um, in the area of research or advocacy. So the first perspective is from the survivor's point of view. And then there is also a perpetrator whose mental health we must consider if we really need to prevent uh, any form of interpersonal abuse. And the third perspective, I'm taking that of the witness. What do I mean by survivor, perpetrator, witness? Say, for instance, uh, let's say there is intimate partner violence between you know, a couple and there is a child. Maybe the man who is abusing would be the perpetrator. Uh, the victim, we are calling the survivor. And then maybe the child who witnesses the mental health angle of that child must also be taken, no? So therefore, the broadly, our area of focus today is understanding that interface between interpersonal abuse and mental health from three perspectives, the survivor's perspective, the perpetrator's perspective, as well as the witness's perspective. Hmm? So I'm going to... Um, uh, highlight on uh, intimate partner violence, child sexual abuse, and if time permits, we'll also look at uh, the bullying perspective. For, so let's begin. Intimate partner violence, let's talk about uh, this topic from all the three uh, angles. I'm just introducing few concepts. You know, I'm introducing few concepts. This first slide uh, that I have on intimate partner violence is from uh, the, per, uh, the perpetrator's angle. Look at this, the first uh, the component that I have. Uh, I'm sure you're able to see the three terms here. Family only batterer, dysphoric borderline batterer, and antisocial batterer. All of these uh, categories of batterers are engaging in domestic violence, intimate partner violence, let's say. But what about these typologies? Why am I speaking about this? Now, this is proposed by Holdsworth, Munro, and Stewart they made an attempt to uh, understand the broad categories of batters in connection to mental health. Look at the first category, family-only batterer. Hmm? Who's this family-only batterer? 
the family only batterer is engaging in abusive behavior only within the family they could also be coming across as being a gentleman outside you know sometimes uh, maybe in their office if somebody learns that this uh, batterer uh, is being extremely abusive towards the spouse maybe people in the office will not even uh, trust your words because they have such an image outside higher are the chances that family only batterers right they don't suffer from any psychopathology you know they are perfectly aware of the relationship dynamics they believe that somebody at home maybe the spouse or the child is somebody that they consider in their mind to be inferior powerless and therefore they are being violent uh, in the home front so they are the family only batterer what did i say higher are the chances that they do not suffer from any psychopathological condition now look at the second uh, the category according to uh, holzwert munro and stewart they're talking about dysphoric borderline batterer now this group there could be you know a possibility of a mental health concern uh, these are the people sometimes who would kill with their love you know you might have uh, come across incidents where in extreme possessive you know they're so possessive and that in itself creates a claustrophobic environment for uh, the person living with dysphoric borderline batterer sometimes may suffer from uh, dependent personality disorder sometimes they could also be suffering from borderline personality disorder and in connection to that uh, let's say substance abuse hmm? an example i will give an example could be let's say uh, somebody is married uh, to a person with this particular uh, you know the mental uh, the framework uh here is a person who would say you know i love you so much that i cannot live with you even for a day so please don't go to your uh, mother's parents place or don't meet your friends 24/7 you need to be with me to begin with maybe the person could be like okay you know this is an expression of love but imagine 24/7 this person the survivor is disconnected with everybody the family of origin you know the friends colleagues so much so that you know these individuals are thinking that maybe this lady in this case is uh, not interested in connecting with them and then what can happen is the abuse can intensify and then are you able to imagine what happens to the survivor now the survivor is isolated from everybody you know and then is stuck exclusively with the perpetrator but look what the perpetrator did to begin with it did not even come across as violence right it almost felt like please don't go without you i can't live now if somebody makes an attempt to move it's like if you go i'm going to attempt suicide you see for all you know there is a mental health condition that is probably undetected but mostly mostly it could be schizoid personality disorder or uh, borderline uh, personality disorder even if it's not to the extent of a disorder but we could see certain traits of which which is uh, making the relationship an abusive one and then look at the last category anti social batters you know uh, i i came across a study which pointed out how um let's say uh, during pregnancy and delivery right you know the number of deaths that's experienced among women that's lesser than uh, the number of women who are dying in the hands of the batter it's not an age where uh, death is you know the common among women and yet because of domestic violence if they are dying for all you know they are then living with somebody who could be considered an anti social batter who is this anti social batter anti social batterer are definitely uh, suffering from uh, you know severe uh, psychopathological condition maybe an anti social personality disorder or you might have heard of psychopathy and sociopathy right so much so that their behavior also has a, a legal repercussion they are the ones see unlike family only batterers who are only abusive inside the family right anti social batterers also have problems in the society they are abusive they are violent towards people at their home as well as they are violent even in their uh, the workplace so you see when we are looking at intimate partner violence if we do not consider the mental health perspective of the perpetrator 
how can we be even addressing you know prevention of intimate partner violence yeah think about it hmm? this is one uh, you know idea i wish to uh, share the other idea is see every time you're talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence we usually talk about ptsd right what is ptsd post traumatic stress disorder and usually we talk about it from the survivor's perspective or the witness's perspective but i want you to also remember there's a lot of work that's happened in the area of look at the word that i have put on the screen perpetration induced traumatic stress you know this is like uh, we're killing we're harming somebody causes the perpetrator harm ptsd that's there you know victim's perspective it's widely spoken but look at this traumatic stress this traumatic stress is experienced by the perpetrator just recollecting that i am being so violent the initial uh, the studies uh, were with uh, combat veterans or police uh, who are in uh, the line of work hmm? or i think there are a couple of studies on uh, medical professionals who are uh, you know for medical uh, reasons engaging in abortion you know the, that work but there is also uh, you know uh, studies which are looking at what is the trauma that's experienced by the perpetrator of domestic violence so sometimes in order to desensitize themselves imagine uh, here is a perpetrator who is you know physically sexually assaulting the victim you know and then to desensitize himself or herself they might engage in the same behavior over and over again sometimes have you seen you watch a horror movie the first time it's scary the second time mm, you can still manage by the third time you could be cracking joke and watching the movie and nothing happens why because you got desensitized what was horror can no longer seem horror the same thing can happen even for the perpetrators they may engage in more the frequency you know of uh, victimizing somebody so that they can overcome their own traumatic stress yeah look at uh, it from this perspective as well okay now let's move on to uh, the perspective of the victim i'm sorry for that picture you know but imagine uh, there are uh, victims of domestic violence who continue to stay in the abusive relationship for all you know because there is the syndrome called the battered women syndrome look at this what's this called battered women syndrome we usually talk about battered women syndrome uh, in the context of ptsd itself but it is something that we need to further focus why because a woman who's battered over a period of time may come to believe that somehow the violence is their fault they somehow may place the responsibility of the perpetrator's behavior onto themselves they may believe that i deserve it and then there could also be an irrational belief in the mind of fathers uh, battered women that you know the abuser is so violent that anything could happen something so uh, tragic and uh, intense so therefore battered women syndrome is uh, something we speak about uh, in the context of ptsd but exclusively related to domestic violence you know think about it repeatedly getting stuck in that violence uh, cycle the cycle of abuse almost like a habit now and uh, this battered uh, the victim believes it's their fault hmm? so that mental health angle should also be focused on so i've talked to you about the perspectives of um, the perpetrator and the victim i'd be very happy to take questions uh, the later and it's almost like each topic we could be speaking for days together so i'm just you know surfing but i hope it gives you enough and more lead uh, to take your own learning you know the forward look at this i'm still continuing with uh, the victim's perspective of ipv the first concept i want to talk here is psychological entrapment let me ask you a question is there anybody here who was told by a friend that look that netflix series is awesome or that novel is fantastic 
uh, you're like, okay, fine. I'm going to read it based on the comments and reviews you got from others. You opened that novel. You read 50 pages. It's so boring. And then uh, you're like, okay, it's 250 page uh, novel. Hmm? 50 page things are bad. Let me read 100 page. Maybe things get better. You read 100 pages and it's terrible. You know, you wanted to have a good time watching the movie or reading a novel, but it's terrible. The same thing to do is what? What's the same thing to do? What's the safe thing to do? To close the book. The author is not next to you with the gun point, right? It's like you have to read, you can close the book. But then you know what many do? They'll get a headache, but they have to see through the entire book. Bought headache, developed migraine, but still they wanted to read the entire book. Now apply this concept to a victim of domestic violence or IPV. What is IPV? Uh, intimate partner violence. This person, one year dating violence maybe, things are not okay with this person. Very, very abusive. The safest thing to do is to maybe talk or quit the relationship. One year. No. Let me see. Maybe in two years, things would change. Things didn't change. Five years, half a decade, things didn't change. You know, you saw the antisocial batterers, right? They may not change for the entire lifetime. If there is a personality disorder, uh, we call it egosynctonic symptoms. Egosynctonic symptoms means they're not aware of what they're doing. So they may not change five years. What happens to victims or survivors of violence is when they look back five years of time, five years of energy, instead of calling the relationship quits, they want to give it even more time, even more time to see with a hope that things may improve. Maybe with the family only batterer, maybe with dysphoric borderline batterer with the right intervention, things may improve. But if somebody is living with an antisocial, uh, the batterer, things are difficult. There is a need for a legal intervention. So therefore, psychological entrapment means maybe it's not the abuser who's entrapped us. It's our own psychological trappings in the form of, I have put one decade of effort in this relationship and then getting trapped. Please, please be aware of it. The other component is learned helplessness that Martin Seligman has, uh, you know, made it uh, very popular as a concept. Look at this. Is it very difficult for this horse to run away with that chair? No, but several survivors of uh, domestic violence are under an illusion, you know, that the abuser is so, so strong. The environmental factors are so, you know, uh, strong that I need to live and die in this abusive relationship, but I cannot escape. Hmm? So learned helplessness. The horse, like in this picture, is not helpless. It is strong. And yet it has learned to believe that you, I need to stay stuck. So therefore, there is a need to talk about the mental health concerns of the survivors of uh, IPV, hmm? intimate partner violence. Now look at this. I'm going fast, I feel, but uh, uh, is that the feedback? Are you all okay, the way we are going? Okay, sure. Look at this. One quick point. There are hundreds and thousands of studies, but one quick point regarding the witnesses of domestic violence. Hmm? See, intimate partner violence, uh, is domestic violence that's happening between couple, but domestic violence can go far beyond the couple, you know, as well. Hmm? Look at this. An example of what can happen to the mental health of the witness. And I've taken the example of a child, maybe the father and mother, domestic violence, intimate partner violence. What can happen to the child? I'm introducing two uh, concepts here internalizing and externalizing problems can be developed by children. What do I mean by internalizing problem? Say for example, uh, depression, wherein a person keeps their, their feelings of helplessness, worthlessness, hopelessness within. They don't talk about it. They're not expressing it aggressively. But depression is an example of an internalizing condition, wherein 
this child has witnessed uh, domestic violence and maybe the the fear maybe the child feels hopeless living in that particular uh, the home so you see internalizing problems means the child just keeps quiet suffers in silence does not talk in the school the child can once again become a victim of bullying imagine somebody says something a child who is assertive may stand up but here is a child who's witnessed violence they know the power of a bully they understand it far better than anybody else so they can just go to the a shell hmm? anxiety is an example of uh, internalizing problem wherein uh, you know afraid of everything hmm? and you might have also heard of some children who develop severe fever without any obvious reason this is what we uh, consider you know somatic complaints no it's like psychological pain causes somatic complaints somatic means body based complaint hmm? so shweta in the chat is also telling hypochondriasis hypochondriasis is uh, sometimes like a small thing a small symptoms exaggerate the you know imagine i have a scratch and i think i've got skin cancer hmm? that's another you know that's another but here in internalizing problems a child may truly develop somatic complaints like uh, puking imagine the parents are fighting the child believes and then um, you know the child faints or the child pukes so that the parents attention turns here and shweta is also correct hypochondriasis is very difficult to have medical explanation later a child might develop uh this uh you know the somatoform uh, the disorder quite possible so you see a child who's witnessed violence can either develop internalizing problems or externalizing problems what do i mean by externalizing problems aggression a child who's witnessed a mother probably getting physically abused may go to the school and become a bully i can't hit my dad i can't hit my mother but let me go hit my juniors in the school you see the connections so externalizing problem is aggression internalizing is the problem is directed towards oneself whereas externalizing problem means i cause problems to others so therefore i gave an example certain examples of how intimate partner violence has mental health a causes as well as consequences and we need to look at it from three perspective the uh, victim or the survivor we have the perpetrator and the the witness hmm? even if all of you take this one message that every time we are looking at violence let us look at it from three perspectives the survivors the perpetrators and the witness perspective say for example sometimes you might have seen no in a public transport abuse is so common sexual molestation is so common and yet hundreds of people are there yet nobody does anything it's called bystander effect bystander effect is the more the number of people who are <coughs> witnessing the crime the lesser are the chances that any of them are going to go and support the the survivor why because each one is thinking uh, you know the others would do others would do but then looking at it just as a bystander effect look at how emotionally we are desensitized to others pain empathy empathy should lead to empathetic concern but sometimes we may even say oh my god it shouldn't have happened but yet we do nothing so if empathy does not translates to compassion in the context of abuse if empathy causes one self distress so much so that we sympathize with the victims and do nothing then what's the point of that empathy no think about it hmm? so therefore witnesses is a neglected area and we really need to one look at it hmm? so let me move on to the next topic i don't know how we are doing on the time i see that uh, already it's half an hour uh let me take another 10 uh, minutes and then maybe we'll open it up for uh, the interaction yeah okay my screen got frozen just a second can you all see the screen uh yes we can see the screen 
am unable to um, move on to the next uh, one second, I'm unable to move on to the next slide. <clears throat> yes. Okay, I have no idea what happened. All right. Now, can you see? Uh, yes. All right, sure. I, I can't move <laughs> for some reason. All right, then. If I'm not able to uh, share the screen, then let me go ahead. <clears throat> Ma'am, should I share that? Oh. Yeah, now you can see, no? <clears throat> okay. See, now I'm going to talk about child sexual abuse. And now let's look at child sexual abuse from the perspective of, uh, you know, the perpetrators, the victims, and uh, the, uh, the witnesses. Look at this. On this slide, uh, even though there is no clear uh, bifurcation on the victims, the perpetrators, but it's going to touch upon uh, both uh, these aspects. This is one study which is speaking about how, listen to this, those children who experienced both emotional abuse as well as sexual abuse during their childhood, <clears throat> they had an increased chance of poor mental health and they further when they grew and when they became adults they started having sexual contact with children you know so what does this mean somebody who was a victim of child sexual abuse as well as were emotionally abused depending on where they lived there was an increased you know the chance of such children becoming adults with poor mental health, as well as these adults later began to have sexual contact with children. Yeah, what does it mean? This is a study which is pointing at a victim becoming a abuser. Maybe a child who was sexually abused, if they had received the emotional support, maybe they could have recuperated from the trauma. Maybe they could have become adults who could have channelized what they went through into something constructive. Maybe they could have, uh, you know, did campaigns on uh, protecting other children. But here is an example, you know, a study indicating how a child was sexually abused as well as emotionally abused. When they turned adults, the poor mental health was given as well as they in turn began to abuse children. This is an example of how a victim can become an abuser. Yeah, look at it. Why? Because when the child was sexually abused, there was no emotional support. Maybe look at it. And then in the second study, what I'm pointing at is, uh, you know, the suicidal behavior among those who were sexually abused as children. This is a study which is looking at uh, male, you know, the children who later when they became adults, they had uh, suicidal, uh, you know, the behavior. And according to this study, they are looking at five factors that played a role that contributed to the suicidal behavior when the child victims are now adults. Yeah, are you all understanding? We are looking at male, you know, adults now who've engaged in suicidal behavior. And the study is pointing at five factors which are playing a very important role. <clears throat> First, the duration of the sexual abuse. What does this mean? The longer the sexual abuse lasted, the correlationally higher are the chance of suicidal ideation in adulthood. Hmm? Look at this. Duration of sexual abuse. Sometimes it could be a one-off, but sometimes it can last for years. I remember there was this one case from Chennai. Uh, I, I think it was like two or three years uh, back. This 12-year-old girl, okay, who was auditorily challenged. Many of you might remember this case. There was this report that close to, I'm not sure about the number of uh, perpetrators, close to 16 to 22 abused this girl who had an auditory impairment. And where was abuse happening? Well, within the confines of her apartment complex. Who were they? Who were these people? The security guard, the gardener, the plumber, the lift operator, you know, 
and then you know how long abuse has happened for 6 to 7 months and nobody realized the girl is getting drugged and raped and then she goes back to her home she is going back to her home and yet nobody realized that the child is abused we have poxo law but then if we don't even realize who are the victims then what can the law do i all with me so therefore what i'm indicating is duration is a factor i'm not saying one time abuse is not traumatic it is but then the longer it lasts it has even more negative repercussions the second factor is the use of force during sexual abuse there is this phenomena called grooming most of the sexual offenders sometimes would establish trust with the child trick the child abuse the child and blackmail the child what did i say the term what did i say grooming there's a lot of work that's happened in the area of grooming i want you to please uh, read up and in if there is any other opportunity i want to talk about the limitations of our models in training children on good touch and battage we are dealing with criminals here yeah? and then we are simply going and telling children good touch bad touch if there is bad touch come and report what are we even doing hmm? at mukta we have several uh, models if you are interested please volunteer with us we'll train you so that you can go conduct trainings with the community with children the right way okay that apart looking at this look at this high conformity of masculine norms what does that mean imagine here is a man who is sexually abused as a child but believes hey, as a man i cannot be getting abused you know a girl can get sexually abused but as a man i cannot be getting abused that in itself is a double trauma somebody at least will seek help right if they acknowledge that i am abused and i need help but here is somebody who believes i am a man and i got abused and if a female has abused you see the power dynamics so high conformity to masculine norms that's not helping it's actually worsening the mental health then the level of depressive symptoms you might know the range right mild to moderate to severe to profound hmm? and persistent su uh, suicidal ideation all of this is worsening the mental health as well as is increasing the odds of suicide attempt yeah so i'm here talking about uh, you know the victim's perspective now i quickly thought i'll introduce to these terms look at this i mean um, more research must happen but with whatever little research is there i just want to uh, present uh, to you these three ideas we are aware of pedophiles pedophilia it's a paraphilia yeah it's a sexual disorder it's a sexual disorder it's a mental health concern who are pedophiles those who are sexually attracted to children okay but i want you to look at the second category what's the second category that i have put here non offending pedophiles who do you think they are non offending pedophiles look at the word they are pedophiles that means they are sexually attracted to children but they are non offending what does non offending means they are not acting upon their urges they are aware they are sexually attracted to children but they are not acting upon their urges uh, i am not sure if this documentary is still available on netflix two years back i think i remember watching this documentary called the pedophile next door it was uh, you know on netflix i'm not sure if it's available on youtube but if there is a way for you to uh, you know uh, have access to it watch it what's the title pedophile next door there they are talking about look at this word i'm not sure how we would take this the phrase that they are using is virtuous pedophiles virtuous they are attracted to children but they also know they cannot be acting on their urges yeah so therefore you see there is that category also if at all we could provide them psychological support for all you know we could actually be preventing uh, child sexual abuse in a big way 
there's actually a project in uh, university of berlin yeah read up on it it's called project uh, dunkelfeld i might be pronouncing the word wrong okay i'm going to type uh, you know this project on the chat box please have a look at it it's called what project dunkelfeld the word dunkelfeld i believe uh, in german uh, means the dark field what they are doing is they are calling for pedophiles they are saying if you identify yourself as a pedophile you better come and seek help and i believe in the initial years people didn't come but now they are seeking support it's actually an, a fantastic method to uh, prevent abuse isn't it prevent child sexual abuse what's it called project dunkelfeld yeah a non offending pedophiles and then we should also be talking about listen to this phrase non pedophilic child sexual abuse offenders what is this they are not suffering from pedophilia okay but yet they are child sexual offenders what could be the reason sometimes revenge cases of revenge the father of the child this person has a problem to take revenge on the father the child is getting sexually abused or under the influence of a substance are you all with me so you see there are pedophiles but it's equally important that we talk about non pedophilic child sexual offenders yeah uh once again my slides got stuck but okay that's fine i'm uh, going to talk about see uh we need to talk about the non pedophilic child sexual abusers no somebody's work that i have uh, you know immensely uh, admired is finkel hor okay is an american uh, sociologist finkel uh, hor i might be pronouncing the name wrong but with all you know he talks about the four preconditions theory a fantastic theory you know of course there's a lot of uh, the critique but i want you to it's because of the paucity of time i chose this theory he talks about how there are four factors that are important for child sexual abuse to happen first he says the abuser must be motivated to do child sexual abuse so the first factor is what the first precondition is the motivation of the offender maybe there are multiple factors which can motivate the abuser one could be maybe the child serves an emotional you know the purpose for the offender maybe uh, imagine somebody who feels powerless wants to feel powerful now when they engage in sexual activity with another adult maybe they don't feel powerful so they are victimizing a child so maybe there is an emotional congruence there or because of the pedophilia you know a sexual disorder maybe there is sexual arousal you know you see the first factor is the person is motivated to commit this crime you know motivated to for abusing a child that's the first factor the second factor is this person must overcome internal inhibitions right we are all children and we know the dependency the innocence of children and yet this adult is engaging in that behavior that means the second precondition was met what's the second precondition overcoming the internal inhibitions essentially silencing the conscience silencing the guilt how can this happen sometimes uh, alcohol substance or sometimes you know you might have seen uh, the mob mentality right maybe somebody is telling no no we cannot be engaging in gang rape but three people will suppress that voice so you see the second precondition is overcoming the internal inhibitions okay now the third precondition is overcoming the external inhibitions inhibitors what are the examples of external inhibitors if there is a child who has adult supervision if there is a child who is living with adults who are taking care of the child not neglected that in itself 
you know when the government says put cctvs everywhere of course that's not the solution like it's made out to be but then it is one way that we are saying the external inhibitor is there you better be aware of it okay and then the fourth precondition is the abuser overcomes the resistance of the child sometimes when children don't know what's happening to them is abuse how and why would they resist now if anybody is interested in knowing how do we train you know the children please connect with us we are going to train you and then uh, you know uh, in number of projects you know you could engage how to train children that's important because even if the first three conditions are met if the fourth precondition is not met abuse can still not happen okay now at all these preconditions shouldn't we be considering the psychological perspective of the abuser yeah it's very very important okay so i have touched upon uh, these two perspectives we can certainly go on and on and on sometimes i have the habit of making it seem like my clock is stuck and i still have half an hour or one hour but let me not be that liar today and uh, if there are any questions i would like to take there are two more uh, you know the slides that i had but i'm guessing you know through the questions if i can uh, answer that i will otherwise i'll touch upon that component any um, any comments anything that you wish to share thank you so much ma'am for the lecture i think uh, kanika has a question mm -hmm. um, kanika i'm trying to unmute you if you would like to speak sure yes. sure sure hi ashwini i'd like to yeah, first hi. say that you know uh, you took a really difficult topic and put it across so nicely that you know we did not feel that it was very heavy so thank you for that thanks, it's thank not you. easy to talk about abuse in any form and you did focus a lot on children so thank you um my my question is you know when i think back to uh the older generation and even like like you know generations who are alive with us mm -hmm. it feels like there's a lot of intimate intimate partner violence that happens and has happened but you know is it linked <clears throat> to our patriarchal mindset wherein we think you know the men has ma the man is all powerful and one way for him to show his power is um to abuse to and of course abuse various family members in the house from spouse to children to everyone else uh, so i was wondering if you know that's uh, some sort of a background when we talk Absolutely, about ma'am yeah? you know uh, imagine you know even uh, through the the conversation sometimes uh, intentionally even if i'm the one to say okay he's or her you know the abuser is male or female but everything said and done the statistics mm. tell otherwise battered mm. women syndrome i can say there are battered men syndrome there are but yeah. statistically you know the statistically uh, there is an imbalance and there is no denying it yeah so therefore uh, but what we need to acknowledge is those who are trapped in this patriarchal mindset if they recognize that they are victims of a particular way of thinking mm. at least then something some change can happen no some change can happen let me you know i'll use uh, kanika's question as the context to talk about how could we be preventing it because kanika actually brought in the perspective of how it is an intergenerational issue sometimes we've heard stories that our grandfather grandmother you know have talked about domestic violence we might have seen that in our own homes with our parents or god forbid but it could be happening to any of us here and we might have seen children suffering so right now there are four generations we are talking and uh, sometimes nothing seems to have changed for covid when covid uh, you know the cases emerged they said how uh, the child helpline said it shot up by several thousands you know it's it's how i mean here is one pandemic and these are shadow pandemics right child abuse domestic violence so let me talk about the three levels of prevention three levels of prevention primary secondary and tertiary <clears throat> okay now let me first talk about tertiary prevention so that any of you who are working on uh, in the you know policy making or for research you can then say okay i intend to work at this level this level yeah 
for so i'm introducing a framework primary secondary and tertiary tertiary prevention means stopping violence or abuse after violence has occurred you know stopping violence after violence has occurred you might have seen uh, you know there was this one uh, very catchy advertisement i think this organization called breakthrough india yeah they did this bell baj wo oh, campaign you remember if you hear screams from uh, uh, you know the house you know the next door simply go on ring the bell you are already hearing a victim you know the screaming and uh, we know it's a collectivistic culture where we don't care what our family members think about us but we really do care what our neighbors you know think about us so go ring the bell so that was one tertiary prevention method no abuse has happened we couldn't prevent it but we went and stopped it from further happening one example but there are several other methods legal intervention psychological intervention but tertiary prevention means what abuse has occurred we are going to stop it from further happening remember that case of that 12 year old girl that i said from chennai six months if you read qualitative research sometimes you know you hear stories where 20 years child has suffered from in silence so tertiary prevention is equally important then there is secondary prevention what does secondary prevention mean nobody is a victim yet okay but there is a huge risk the vulnerability is high so when we work with that group where the vulnerability of either becoming a victim or a perpetrator is high then we are working at secondary prevention for instance any child can become a victim of child sexual abuse okay but maybe a child who has intellectual disability is under more risk no maybe a child who cannot see is under more risk right or maybe a child who at the age of 12 is exhibiting conduct disorder if there is no psychological intervention can move on to be engaging in criminal offenses as an adult so when we work with vulnerable groups either becoming a victim or you know a perpetrator we are working at which level the secondary level of prevention are you all with me now let's look at primary level of prevention <clears throat> a primary level of prevention what does that mean we are going to train anybody and everybody not just the victims not just the perpetrators or the vulnerable groups the entire community and i think uh, meera when she was introducing uh, me she talked about a campaign that we did called child safety national priority when i travel to all the 29 states okay now 28 states you know 29 states uh, and what we did was train doctors nurses journalists lawyers children parents if i am traveling in a ola cab then that ola driver is a participant you know you leave nobody now that's an example of primary level of prevention but specific to a topic and i know i'm using kanika's question to build you know all that i want to say but when kanika is asking about is the patriarchal you know that that attitude is there a contribution it is and you know at which level tertiary secondary primary but even at the primordial level are you listening to me there is something even higher than primary level of prevention which is primordial level of prevention a primordial level of prevention when we are working we are empowering everybody not just on the topic when you are talking about the topic specific to everybody it's primary prevention but primordial prevention means when you address that patriarchal attitude which makes violence all right you know say for example here is a family who don't sexually abuse physically abuse but uh, one day the women didn't cook there is a cold shoulder one day she was working on a deadline because a research article there is a third review she couldn't cook ordered back to back from swiggy nobody said a word it wasn't violence within codes but you see that is at the primordial level 
that's at the primordial level these are those subtler examples it comes in no so therefore patriarchal attitude if we are challenging we need we need to better challenge it at which level primordial level by the time it comes to primary level i'll give you an example i went to my school carmel convent high school on sarjapur road okay i studied there a second i told sisters sisters let's have all children together you know one exam all children together it's okay we can talk about child sexual abuse sister said no 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 it has to be separate girls separately boys separately i said then uh, being denied of an opportunity to speak let me meet these children separately okay first standard second standard boys came first standard means how old 5 6 year olds no this boy he came he started talking to me akka why ka for us this workshop girls you go speak ka you know he's telling how old is he 6 years 6 year old boy telling this topic of child sexual abuse is redundant to this group are you listening to me what i'm trying to say here is you see already at primordial level we are a failure this was a workshop at primary level no it was a workshop at primary level of prevention that workshop is on child sexual abuse the workshop was not on addressing the subtler aspects of girls are victims boys are the perpetrators you, that boy tells me later but you see at primordial level we failed that attitude that kanika mentioned is so like they say right brain is like a sponge absorbed <clears throat> so if we are fighting patriarchal attitudes it's not when rape happens the campaigns that is important but we better be fighting it at primordial level no so is there a relation an absolute yes thanks for that question kanika thank you thank you so much kanika and thank you uh, for elaborating on it and covering so well, another yeah. important aspect i believe so um i i don't see any questions yet but some comments uh, of being an excellent session brief and crisp the other Thank one is a so wonderful much. presentation mm -hmm. so i'll just request uh, meera kumar menon to please uh, proceed with her comments and also uh, any questions if she has in mind um shweta uh, we'll uh, come back to you after uh, meera's comments and also seetha i see a hand raise we'll come back to you Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Nihika, and uh, thank you, Ashwini, ma'am. So beautifully, you have covered so many aspects. And one of the things that uh, I had in mind during your presentation uh, was, um, I somehow uh, wondered what really goes on in the mind of these uh, abusers, because um, that is one thing, like you said, which has not been studied. That. extensively perhaps or at least it is not discussed uh, extensively so do people just wake up one morning and decide that you know today i am going to abuse somebody and since you said that um, when it comes to family batterers it is not necessary that they i mean it is not usual that they might have some sort of psychopathological issues so what really happens there uh, why why exactly do they do it and then coming to the next slide about um about the women or whoever it is the victims who take it uh, who have learned uh, these um behaviors of uh, not resisting and just you know keeping on succumbing to it what kind of more vulnerable to it and why do they do it actually i mean to some extent it is a learning process but what what kind of people are more vulnerable to it and why why do they do it uh so these are two questions that i had and uh, yeah and obviously there is no doubt that your work is profound and uh, extremely relevant to our uh, society and uh, very very appreciative of the same yeah thanks mira for uh, the feedback as well as uh, the two questions that you asked i know these are uh, you know the questions that uh, you know we need a lot of uh, the dialogue but let me try and uh, put it in as succinct a manner as possible you know when you are asking about you know abusers do they wake up one day absolutely not but they can act one day just like that 
you know you see the attitude maybe it's shaped over several years but action right sometimes can just happen you know so uh, maybe uh, you know in connection to what we were discussing that four levels of prevention mm-hmm. what i would say is somebody who has already committed a heinous crime is already at which level tertiary level right because mm-hmm. abuse has happened that means how did they engage in that action that means the failure at the first three levels right a failure at all the first three levels primordial prevention maybe nobody talked about uh, another life being important just as one's own you know maybe there is an attitude that uh, you know if you are taking the batras it's not about male uh, female but i'm just giving an example maybe the attitude is some lives are superior than the the rest and therefore you know violence is okay primordial level at primary level you know i have met uh, several people i mean um, my ongoing doctoral work right uh, is on women who burn themselves you know this is called self incineration women who burn themselves if you go to victoria hospital you know which has asia's largest burn ward hmm? it's the largest and then in uh, bangalore there is also st john's hospital if you go there these are not burnt bodies these are bodies that have melted like candle and sometimes homicidal burns but the majority of it is suicidal burns and when you're working with women you know uh, who burnt themselves there is also male ward but mostly it's accidental in nature or if they have burnt themselves it's under the influence of alcohol so i don't see much of domestic violence as you see in these uh, burns ward of women what sometimes when you are talking right in that context or in the counseling session sometimes there are women who say ipv is violence they are like yeng madam ganda odudra in kannada they are telling ganda odudra adukku ond kanoon idya what does that mean if my husband is hitting me there is law for that you know we are actually doing a series you know uh, the last six uh, four sessions have happened i think uh, we have two more sessions at mukta on legal awareness tomorrow we have a session on uh, law uh, pertaining to uh, crimes against queer people hmm? uh, last week we had it on uh, laws pertaining to domestic violence or child abuse i forget but then if you are interested uh, you know maybe niharika i requested to share that information you might have received please attend the session please attend the session what i am telling is at primary level when people don't know it's a crime in the first place they will do it no i'll give one example i was uh, in rajasthan okay in uh, jaipur in one of uh, the hostels uh, i think they were all below the age of 18 hmm? and i was talking about pokso law my hindi is bad so it was also a bit of a comedy session and we were managing it you know we were managing it quite okay this one a child 17 and a half year old and he told that i'm emphasizing on it because his comment was about his age he said i feel in um, uh, hindi is telling mujhe lagta hai so okay let me not go for hindi that would take time in english i'm paraphrasing he says i believe pokso law says if i am a child i am 17 and a half year old legally i am a child if i am abusing a 10 year old child it's not an offense madam you know he's telling like that you know in hindi wo oh, offense nahi hota hai madam main 17 and a half ka hu main abhi child hu something like that you know i am a child if i am abusing another kid of 10 years old that is not abuse now is that what pokso says pokso tells pokso is very clear if you are 17 and a half year old and is sexually abusing a 12 year old it is still offense where will you go differs it's still a crime but will you go to the regular jail or will you go to the observation home there is a difference but no law is telling that it is not offense imagine this child with that mentality if nobody corrected or nobody educated this child on legal awareness what would happen at primary level we failed primordial level failed even at primary level we would fail comes to the secondary level 
victimizes a vulnerable person even that vulnerability we couldn't do anything he would go on to victimize and there are perpetrators so therefore you see uh, nobody wakes up as an abuser but systemic failure at all these levels of prevention makes one to become vulnerable either to become a victim or to become a perpetrator yeah the other component about you asked about victims who are more prone i really wish there could be one succinct way of putting it across and saying okay these are the ones who would become uh, the victims or not but uh, there isn't however however mm, <clears throat> let me put it across this way uh, if there is one skill <clears throat> if there is one skill that i believe when taught to everybody <clears throat> children adults wherever we are that we could be preventing an individual can either become a victim or an abuser is the skill of assertiveness yeah maybe this could also be my last comment sorry niharika you know my clock stuck 5 minutes back you know oh, no, no. it's 5 5 yeah i'll take 1 minute yeah assertiveness but i'm not looking at this american import of assertiveness which is the ability to say no no yeah that's one aspect of assertiveness assertiveness is also to say i don't know right now i'll get to know and then i'll come back and tell no or yes hmm? so what is my definition of assertiveness um let's look at it on a continuum on one hand there is submissiveness yeah what is submissive an individual with sub, uh, submissive personality would they violate others rights anyone would they violate others rights would submissive individuals violate others rights they don't they don't violate you know but when others are violating their rights they don't know how to defend yes or no so submissive individuals with submissive orientation to their personality let me not call them submissive people because there is any day more to any individual than that one personality trait let me say individuals with submissive personality orientation are more prone to become victims no prone to become victims because they don't violate others right they don't there is tit for tat but they don't have that orientation they don't violate others rights but when others are violating their rights they don't know how to defend what is the opposite of submissiveness aggressiveness isn't it how are individuals with aggressive personality orientation do they violate others rights happily individuals who are aggressive they will violate but when others are violating their rights will they keep quiet will they keep quiet see from individuals to organizations to at large parties you can see the orientations there are orientations to you know how we believe behave aggressive submissive neutral yeah now let's look at assertiveness what i'm saying is individuals to organizations you can see these traits yeah now let's look at assertiveness what is assertiveness assertive individuals do not violate others rights and at the same time when others are violating their rights they do not let that happen also are you with me so for mira's a uh, question of who is likely to become victims anybody can but somebody who is more prone to this side no that submissive side are more prone to and people who are prone to this aggressive side they are more prone to becoming abusers so if any training is looking at empowering anyone to either not becoming victims or perpetrators let us please train people on assertiveness empathetic assertiveness because assertiveness corporate sector it sometimes it's it's ruined you know the concept of assertiveness is go google okay for pictures on assertiveness you would only get pictures of people telling no on hand there is no no it's such a diluted version of assertiveness it's it's sad a certain individual is somebody who do not violate others rights and at the same time will not let others violate theirs 
and when this happens their mental health is also fine and they will neither become victims nor become perpetrators yeah so let us be assertive let us be assertive even as witnesses <clears throat> you see a witness who is submissive will turn a blind eye and go yes or no yeah witnesses who are aggressive will add more fuel sometimes to the violence that's happening with good intent only nobody questions the intent but sometimes more violence happens when a witness is more on the aggressive side but when a witness is assertive they will know how to protect themselves and also they will do something to the the victim no preventing and yeah legally or any other way so an assertive environment is likely to create a safer a better world that's the the hope that's the belief yeah so with this let me stop uh, thank you ma'am thank you meera for your questions and also for your comments so uh, i i believe that shweta's um, a question is somewhat related to what kanika and what meera asked so i'm just going to quickly read out the question in addition sure. to what kanika has said i would like to explore on how much parent parenting and upbringing roles uh, plays a role in the development of the uh, battered woman syndrome the fact that uh, women are always told to be strong and and that their strength lies in the ability to endure and tolerate any kind of emotional or physical abuse i have heard a very racist saying uh, sexist saying that men have uh, physical strength whereas women have emotional strength so um, yeah. it's uh, somewhat similar i i feel that what you have also discussed um, another que- yeah. yeah go ahead go ahead nihar no i i'm just trying to unmute her if she's she wants to add on something to her comment okay so Shweta, i think you... shweta shweta abraham is uh, one of our interns at mukta foundation so oh, shweta okay. is a student at uh, uh, christ university she's pursuing her msw is that you shweta yes ma'am hi am i audible Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I know that the question is kind of similar, which is why, like in the beginning, when Kanika asked, it was just an addition to what she asked, like to the role of patriarchy. I just want to know because you had mentioned the reasons. I mean, behind. I mean, I mean, talked about the syndrome, but I wanted to know how much uh, uh, upbringing and uh, parenting plays a role in that because. this is just a. Uh, I'm just out of curiosity asking because I've seen like oh I've had experiences where. uh from my own grandmother i've got that kind of an explanation that you know it's okay for a husband to hit his wife because mm-hmm. you know that's what it is i mean women are supposed to be submissive and they should have that emotional that's why <clears throat> like it, again it goes into a religious perspective where she says you know god has made women in a way that they have to endure emotional um, abuse okay so okay yeah so i just wanted to not explore on how much uh, this kind of a uh, bringing this this sort of a mentality plays a role because i thought this could happen in many other places sure, sure. as well so you i mean it's a very uh, you know a good point because you are linking if somebody one is surviving abuse but then battered women syndrome is even more severe right i'm glad you are connecting it to uh, the parenting hmm? uh let me touch up on the topic what i'll do is i'll give you leads to further explore yeah because of uh, the paucity of time there is parenting practice and then there is parenting style are you listening to me see parenting style and parenting practice they are two separate practices over a period of time become style yes or no are you all listening to me parenting style can be broadly understood as autocratic parenting yeah imagine as the word suggests if the parents were themselves autocratic imagine i have met women or men also uh, even though rare let's we need to acknowledge met individuals let's say where they say yes my spouse is so cruel but going back to my family of origin is not going to be any less cruel because my parents when i got married i thought i mean i was escaping from one cage and then i ended up here so i would rather die here than go back i'll tell you in a culture where uh, I, even though i don't like the usage of the term arranged marriage love marriage 
but in certain cases i have heard you know uh, uh, the couple saying i married against my parents wish okay now this marriage is not working what do you dread the most a failed marriage or you know going and seeking support i've heard uh, people say i cannot go to my family and hear you know i told you so comment you know that i told you so comment in kannada it comes as nanu gottittu inge agutte anta mujhe pata tha maine pehle hi bola tha looks like my hindi is improving yeah you see there are several who dread this much more than uh, the violence that's happening between the couple so as uh, you know shweta asked parents should provide that safety base you know it should be that safety cocoon but there are circumstances where uh, the parenting strategy style was such that children don't feel hmm? so then a woman is likely to suffer in battered women syndrome no are you understanding because they don't have that safety base so the first one is autocratic parenting not safety base then let me quickly talk about indulgent parents indulgent parents are those when they learn that their child has had a scratch their bp is shooting up their blood pressure is shooting up you know so they are not resilient parents they are the ones who would say if you talk about what you are going through i will cry now a child will say okay let me suffer in silence let me not trouble my parents are you are you understanding this is how life plays out right i've had some who said i i don't have anybody i want to talk to my mom but i love my mom my mom loves me so much love is okay but skills are needed in times of violence isn't it now both of them will sit and cry finally they'll cry enough and say okay where what do we do nothing you go back to your house i'll go back to my house where is the support instead of one battered women we have two battered women sitting and talking so indulgent parents don't have skills they have all the love but don't have the skills to support a child then there is negligent parent at least autocratic parents were there to scold us and to make us feel miserable negligent parents are not there in the scene they are not there so who do you talk to to thin air you see but the best type of parenting is democratic parenting there are various other terms they use in literature a uh, democratic parent is where they have trained children on skills higher are the chances that children of dem democratic parent higher chances only i'm not predicting nobody can predict what will happen to human beings higher are the chances that they are assertive <clears throat> autocratic parents you can imagine the mindset of the child no they themselves can become autocratic so democratic parents <clears throat> have built the skills in children to protect themselves and if by chance they cannot protect themselves they know that as a parent i must also stand up for the rights of my children so is there a link definitely there is a link shweta i would say the first three parenting styles the parents when they have they cannot support their children they cannot sometimes they will support but that is not to the well, well being of uh, the children so democratic parenting they say you no know, the democratic parents uh, last comment on this question democratic parents um, the way they interact with their children right it's iron fist in a velvet gloves did you listen to me assertive individuals are also like this iron fist in a velvet gloves why iron fist how is it firm but how is velvet gloves gentle imagine the abuser how are they only iron fist no they'll break the knuckles of the others submissive individuals how are they only velvet gloves others will only wring and put it on the the wash line but when you are assertive when you are using democratic parenting style and when children are also democratic our interaction with every other individual we come across is going to be how assertive metaphorically iron fist in a velvet gloves iron fist in a velvet gloves you are gentle but firm needed right you want to violate others rights and you wouldn't let others violate yours and you would also stand up for the rights of others and that's needed yeah
thank you Thanks, so much ma'am as we are running a little ahead of our time we'll just take Grand. one last question uh, from uh, sita s uh, meera kumar menon will be opening up the whatsapp groups as soon as we are done with this lecture and you can ask more questions uh, uh, you know from ashwini ma'am and she'll be responding and uh, also she has shared her whatsapp number also on the chat i think one of the questions by gr prasad was how to get in touch regarding the workshops and other things so uh, meera will be sharing her contact also on the whatsapp group so uh, sita i'm uh, i'm trying to unmute you if uh, possible please go ahead with your question i think you have typed out two questions that i saw um sita s yeah please go ahead good evening ma'am thanks very much for the wonderful talk um you, just wanted to ask you two <clears throat> questions one uh, i think um, compared to earlier we uh, are getting more and more desensitized simply because of the <clears throat> aggressiveness exhibited in the media movies etc etc so is there a way that psycho psychologists psychologists like you have a say in this at least when it comes to things coming to our homes or it has to be controlled only by the parents and is that all the second question is how do you and your team um maintain your emotional strength when you have to deal with victims and perpetrators regular on a regular basis sure ma'am thank you so much for um <clears throat> both these questions ma'am now regarding the content on the media no i mean uh, uh, several uh, Uh, mental health professionals are uh, have conducted research and it's also about your networking no ma you know sometimes because the policy makers are one and researchers are another group when both of them come together is when effective policies can happen hmm? so therefore if you are asking me is there a role that mental health professionals can play i would say an absolute yes but sometimes does our training prepare us to collaborate with uh, and do advocacy because all of this is advocacy right sometimes no you know no so what i'm saying is the world as we know it the problems the world has mm -hmm. all of this requires interdisciplinary approach to tackle come up with solutions isn't it hmm? so say for example now at mukta first it was predominantly uh, psychologists uh, psychologist driven organization but slowly we recognize that our certainness that i was talking about is not just an emotional skill it also comes with legal awareness so now we are bringing in lawyers no now we are bringing in lawyers now we are bringing in medical uh, professionals now we are bringing in forensic uh, neuropsychologists so what i'm trying to say here is for policy level changes to happen a lot of interdisciplinary work must happen and psychologists must also put themselves out there you know get go beyond the four walls of uh, the clinic no when we can do that i think the you know the lawmakers uh, would also see that our presence is there and it's quite an important one so it takes uh, you know a lot of parties to work together that's one but if this is not happening the best thing that one could do is parents right or any adult in the life of a child or and also adults themselves being responsible hmm? so that's one and thanks for that question about how do we manage our emotions no yeah thank you for that question um what can i say uh and also mukta foundation mostly works at the primary level of prevention that's our uh you know the main focus but however something that uh, <clears throat> personally i practice and i also encourage my team members to practice is not to look at individuals as passive victims of circumstances are you listening to me you know not looking at people as passive victims of circumstances instead looking at them as active survivors what do i mean you know instead of asking somebody what happened to you abuse has happened i know that instead of asking what happened to you can i ask when that happened how did you respond imagine what i'm trying to say here is 
if i have survived to tell the tale of what i have gone through then i must have some skills no that have survived and when you look at that skill as somebody who's working with them there's so much to learn i mean imagine a child who is 6 years old who is sexually abused tells that when i color no i'll forget the pain you see that are you listening to me can an adult do that can i do that i don't know if i'm abused i don't know i can have that degree of resilience i met children who say you know auntie when you know when it was paining i colored okay and i was okay see that look at that resilience so what i'm saying is can we also focus on survivor stories and in through your work if you could make that survivor it's not you making they themselves transforming it, when you see that progress no when you see that trajectory of growth not being a passive victim instead an active survivor and when these active survivors become phenomenal thrivers right you know you're not just uh, emotionally energized you're thankful for that process because you got to witness that and where there is gratitude no the energy comes to do more and more so therefore you need to have that perspective none of us are passive victims we are all active survivors in the and if i choose and if i choose i can also become a phenomenal thriver yeah so we also have that project called mukta katha stories of liberation if anybody is interested you can get in touch with us thank you so we all so carry those yeah. stories ma'am sita ma'am every time there's a story of abuse we remember the other story of thriving and with every story that's a possibility so with that possibility you know we receive energy thank you so much ma'am thank you sita ma'am for the two wonderful questions uh, uh before i give a word uh, official word of thanks i would like to highlight once more that meera will be opening up the whatsapp groups and she will be sharing ashwini ma'am's number on them so if you have any other questions please uh, feel free to type it out or uh, get in uh, you know touch with uh, ashwini ma'am personally or even uh, meera if you would like to and also uh, the second point is yes the session has been recorded and it will be uploaded on our uh, nia csp youtube channel very soon and we will be uploading in uh, on our whatsapp groups also or on our website it's uh, like you know on one click you'll be able to find the youtube videos also so with that i thank you i really really thank ashwini ma'am for this wonderful lecture um i i really don't have words to describe what this lecture meant for us but with such easy going and such with uh, i think you you were the uh, you had a iron fist in a velvet glove you you could you know deliver all the facts on our faces and also you know urging us to actually notice and be aware about what is going on and also to take a step to improve it so um i think listening to your lecture i i could see various things in my life listening and you know reading in newspapers also seeing in social media and now my attention has diverted in a very i think uh educated way if i i if i can put it that way i think so thank you so much for accepting our invitation and also for being a wonderful speaker so on behalf of professor sangeeta menon and also our team i i really thank you for your presence today so uh meera would would you like to uh say something oh, i just uh, really wanted to say that i quite agree with niharika's and ma'am's own metaphor about that i invest in a velvet glove i'm sure that must have struck a chord with a lot of us and uh, again on behalf of team csp we really extend our heartfelt thanks to you and i'm sure a lot of people who must be attending today's session might get in touch with you for the wonderful work that you're doing so uh, thank you so much ma'am that would be lovely Yeah. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah. Have have a a well and a meaningful evening everyone. I yes. I generally say have a great evening but today I think we had a lot of thinking yes, to do. Right. So have a reflective evening everyone. We'll see you next Friday with another speaker and another wonderful lecture. Thank you so much Ashwini ma'am. We'll see you next mm-hmm. Friday. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks Nagarika. Thanks all the participants Meera. Thank you. Yeah, everybody. All the Thank best. Thank you ma'am. Lovely connecting with all of you. Thank you.